Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ausley and the Festival Fates for you know, inviting me to be part of this, uh, this year's celebration. And I'm particularly honored to share this stage uh, this afternoon to really sort of, you know, in a way, you know, kind of humbly represent the voices of the world's spiritual traditions. Um, because I believe that uh, when it comes to the discourse on compassion, the, the voices and insights and perspectives of the world's spiritual traditions is an important one. Um, I grew up as a Tibetan refugee child in India. Um, my parents left Tibet in 1959. I was barely a year old. And um, of course, as a child, even though I was a refugee child, when you're very small, you are shielded by your ignorance of what was actually the story around you. Uh, of course, my own parents went through the traumatic experience of displacement. But as I grew up, um, it became quite obvious that you know, we were the recipients and beneficiaries of other people's compassion. The school that I went to is a boarding school that was actually funded by Save the Children's Fund, which is supported by thousands of ordinary British citizens, primarily. Uh, it's a British charity. And uh, as I grew older, I began to notice um, Catholic Relief Service marked on sacks of wheats and stuff. And there was also US aid, you know, food products where this kind of uh, uh, emblematic mark is a two hand join and a handshake with the stars, stars and stripes on the backdrop. So it was, as I began to grow older, it became very obvious that we Tibetans were beneficiaries of other people's compassion. Then of course, having brought up in the traditional Tibetan society, Compassion is really at the forefront of everyday consciousness. Um, you know, the presence of His Holiness, who is the symbol of compassion for the Tibetans, is everywhere with images and his visits and so on. I remember my, you know, parents uh, in the road construction camps, uh, early morning, every morning, waking up, you know, in kind of smoke-filled tents, uh, chanting the four immeasurable prayers, may all sentient beings be happy, may all sentient beings be free of suffering, and so on. So that was the daily prayer. So I kind of took it for granted that that's how everybody you know, was thinking. So compassion really, so it wasn't a big deal. But um, as I grew older and having joined a monastic uh, kind of community, I really began to see uh, compassion in a much more kind of fine-tuned manner. And I when I was about um, 12 years old, I memorized, uh, you know, which is a very celebrated text uh, in the Tibetan tradition by the 8th century uh, Buddhist thinker, master Shantideva, called Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life or the Way of the Bodhisattva. Um, there was a passage which says that um, the Buddhas, having contem contemplated for eons and eons, found that compassion alone to be the most beneficial. I mean, imagine a young monk reading those lines that the Buddhas, the, with their, all their omniscience, reflected forth eons and eons and found compassion to be the most beneficial. And then there was another line that also intrigued me, which says that if you have a choice between you know, revering the Buddha and making offerings to the icons versus having a chance to help another sentient being out of respecting their need, it should, the latter should be treated as more important if you're a Buddhist. So, and then of course, as an adult, uh, I had the privilege of being able to serve His Holiness as his principal interpreter um, for now over 30 years. I began in 85. So I had, in some sense, a privilege to be able to see, you know, what it means to live a compassionate life. Those of you who know His Holiness, you know, what you see is what you get. Really, the, here is an individual who really lives what he preaches, and you can feel the power of the compassion when you're in his presence. There's a kind of a joy as well. But normally when you think of compassion, particularly in the West, you know, we think of hardship, sacrifice, self-sacrifice, pain. But compassion can also go with joy. You can see someone like His Holiness. But this emphasis on compassion um, is not really unique to Buddhism. I mean, of course, in Buddhism, there is a very explicit focus on this. There's a whole meditation practice that goes with it. For example, there's a beautiful statement attributed to the Buddha, which says that uh, 
you know, what is that one thing which when you possess, you have all the other virtues? It is compassion. So this is a statement attributed to the Buddha. So you can see the centrality of compassion as a spiritual value in the Buddhist thinking. But on the other hand, it's not unique to Buddhism. We know, as Increed presented, you know, powerfully, compassion is the common ground on which all the world's major religious traditions come together. You know, religions we know differ in their beliefs, narratives, doctrines, and so on. Sometimes this diversity causes a lot of confusion and conflict and, and, and division. But on the other hand, when it comes to giving a prescription on what it means to live a good life, what we should do and what we should not do, really there's a striking convergence on the lists, even the list of the prescriptions across the traditions. And that's because at the foundation of all the ethical teachings of the world religions is the basic golden rule. Do unto others what you wish to, others to do unto you. Basically, this is because the central question of ethics is really the question of how should I treat others? That's, that's the central question of ethics. Question of ethics is about how you treat others and you would want to be treated by others in the manner in which they respect your dignity as a human being, your basic aspiration for happiness and wish to avoid suffering. That's, and that is compassion. Basically, you would want others to treat you with a sense of compassion and understanding of your own humanity and basic needs. So no wonder there is, you know, we find a version of golden rule in almost all the religious traditions. I mean, there's a slight variations in how it is phrased, but essentially it's the same. Now, the reason why I'm particularly inspired to have, be part of this panel here is because when it comes to discourse and compassion, if you don't include the voices of the spiritual traditions, we are ignoring a huge richness of the history of human thinking and experience that has gone before science became the dominant discourse. And here, we are able, if we bring the religious voice, we will be able to bring a kind of a richness that is not there. And of course, sometimes we're reluctant, particularly in the public discourse, to bring religious perspectives because we are wary of all the differences. But compassion is one area, there's a real commonality. So why ignore that? Now, of course, today, the difference is, as we saw this morning from the Mind and Life session, that there is a new kid on the block, that's science. Science is now talking about compassion. And the beauty of bringing science as part of a discussion on this important topic is that science has a tendency to naturalize and normalize and universalize the concepts and the language around it. And also for a lot of people, science is what makes things real. They can measure, they can calculate, they can demonstrate. So I think science being part of that discourse is a good thing. But on the other hand, we all know from our own personal experience, individual level, we don't need science to tell us about the importance of compassion. We all know from our own personal experience what compassion means to us. Each one of us knows what it is intuitively. You know, when we are in a most distressed state of mind, the most powerful approach is someone listening to our needs compassionately, being fully there present, and giving us a hug. And as parents, I'm a parent of two kids, I know that when a child is completely distressed, no amount of talking is going to calm that child down. The, the instinctive thing, the smart thing to do is to grab the child and hug tightly for a while. And even the heart rate goes down. And this is, as Ingrid pointed out, that's our home because we're trying to make the child return home. And we know, and also when we experience compassion for someone, which we, by the way, sometimes when we listen to talking about compassion from the religious perspective, we tend to elevate it so high that we can't identify with it. But we mustn't forget, compassion is a natural human sentiment. All of us have this capacity. You know, those who have been parents know that when a two-year-old is in total distress, throwing tantrum in front of you, 
you are there fully for that child. I mean, a scientist may say, oh, that's because it's biologically that's your child, there's a gene propagation motivation going behind the scene and all the rest. <laughs> but the fact is, in that moment, your perspective is completely for the other. There is no selfish agenda. You have a tremendous amount of patience because you have opened your heart. And same thing, if we allow, can happen in the, in the case of a total stranger. If a total stranger has been knocked down by in a car or something and it's bleeding and in, in agony, most of us are not going to stay back and say, do I know this person? Does he speak my language? Do we have the same religion? We're not going to do that. We're just going to completely feel for this person and respond to the situation. That is compassion. So when compassion, I mean, I define compassion as the natural sense of concern that arises when we are confronted with someone's suffering or need and we, we wish to do something about it. So when compassion arises, three things happen very quickly, almost simultaneously. One is you see the situation and you understand it. It's a need or a pain. You feel emotionally connected with this and moved by it. That is empathy. You feel for it or feel with the person. And then you want to see the situation change. That's the motivation component. And if this compassion is stronger, maybe you want to do something about it yourself. That is a compassion. That's a natural response. We don't really have to learn. Now, the beauty of science is that science is showing us that the more we are able to live at that level, in that space, respond to ourselves, to our loved ones, to the world around us from that place rather than from the place of negative judgment and criticism, then we ourselves are better off. That's why His Holiness often says that the first beneficiary of your compassion is yourself. You know, whether the compassion translates into something that is really beneficial to the other person depends on many other factors. The person may not be ready to receive your compassion. There might be other factors that are beyond your control, but the, you actually experience the benefit yourself because you open your heart. And when you are able to allow, when you allow to open your heart, you feel expansive. In that space, you actually feel quite great. I mean, that's not your motivation though, of course, but when you are able to allow your, or open your heart, you really feel that. So now science is beginning to show all of these benefits. And also, um, you know, science is increasingly pointing out that compassion is part of our natural human quality. So in the old days, scientists came up with this idea that basic human nature was competitive and selfish and ultimate human aspiration or motivation was to uh, pursuit of self-interest. But now they're opening up because that's a very narrow, one-sided picture of the human reality. Human reality is much more complex. So this shows that compassion is part of our natural makeup. Compassion is good for us. Now, the contemplative traditions, particularly the Buddhist tradition, which has a rich meditation practices, is also showing that we can do something about it. We can make it more of a proactive stance. Because normally what happens is that we leave it to the situation, like anger. When we are triggered, we get angry. When we are inspired, we get compassionate. But we leave it at that. But what the, the kind of the science and the contemplative science is particularly showing is we can actually be more proactive and learn to make compassion an active standpoint from which we can relate to situations, to ourselves, to those around us, and to the world you know, around us. And if we're able to do that, I mean, in the end, of course, that is a choice because we have huge amount of resources from which we can relate to the world, to anger, judgment, fear, and so on. So in the end, it's a matter of choice. But if we do make that choice to relate to situations around us, to ourselves and others from a place of compassion, everything changes. That I can promise you. <laughs> but the choice is up to us individually. So, of course, when we think about the, along these lines, then His Holiness's statement, which seemed quite paradoxical, also makes perfect sense. There's a statement that His Holiness made where he says that if you wish others to be happy, practice compassion. And if you wish yourself to be happy, practice compassion. So I think that's a powerful and beautiful statement. And we, each of us, really it's in our hand. 
you know, and the way to do that is to pay conscious attention to compassion in our everyday life, make compassion part of our everyday intention so that we learn to relate to situations from a compassionate standpoint. And one of the most beautiful things for, about compassion for me is it provides a sense of purpose. You know, when we are able to relate to others from a sense of compassion, we feel kind of you know, needed. We feel valued. And, and also, the thing about a sense of purpose is that it really then makes us much more motivated you know, to be able to be for others. So all around, when we choose compassion, we are able to escape this narrow confines of self-interest. Sometimes we tend to get locked in, especially when we are living in a very competitive consumerist society. So compassion is really one of those things that is least appreciated, particularly in contemporary culture. So we, I would like to appeal to all of you to take a look at compassion with this kind of a new, new eyes and try to make it real in your everyday life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Reflections, comments, reactions? It's interesting because you'll find the, um, you know, when you talked about uh, being there for your child, right? And, and some people saying, well, that's because you, you know, you, you want to preserve your genes sure. or something like this. This is a, part of the challenge with, um, with uh, bringing science into the equation is a very, uh, is, is the idea that somehow this is the, that when we explain something scientifically that it's, it's the fundamental thing. So there's a kind of like hierarchy of explanation, whereas scientific language is just another language, and you can explain the same thing in many ways. So how do you, I don't know, how, how do you, when you talk to scientists, how do you sort of articulate that reality? Um, I mean, you, you actually pointed it out because one of the things about science is that science is a, a particular way of understanding a phenomenon. Uh, they have a certain boundaries in which they operate, um, which involves measure, measurability um, and also which, in, you know, and, and particularly in relation to something like compassion, you know, science can only get involved if there are some behavioral expressions, mm -hmm. whether it is at the level of brain processes or physical behavior or verbal behavior. But the phenomenon itself, what we call compassion, at the moment lies beyond science. I mean, of course, a scientist would say, you know, the compassionate mind is basically the brain state. But that's a kind of a metaphysical question. So I think most of the kind of, you know, more uh, discerning scientists are aware of that. Um, so I, I don't think that's a problem. But of course, there are some people, particularly coming from the scientific background, who have a much more totalizing mm. view of science, that somehow, if it is real, science will be able to explain it, and if it doesn't fall into that remit, then it's somehow not real. Mm. But then those are, of course, are not going to be particularly interested in mm. sitting down with people who are going to talk from the perspective of the interior landscape. Yes, yeah. <laughs> So science is kind of the modern idiom for many people. There are many people without faith, and many people who would like to be compassionate. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. And so in a way, science can become a bridge mm -hmm. for many people. It can give, it can lend some credibility mm -hmm. to all of this for those people that want to have measurement and numbers. Mm -hmm. yes. And from that, they can move on to more a secular sure. kind of approach, which is the same compassion, I mm -hmm. believe, that is also faith-driven. Mm -hmm. But this can be a, an inroad for a lot of, particularly young people that have more of a scientific, rational mind mm -hmm. and don't have much, sure. much to do with faith. Sure. Except that there has to be one thing, that it can be a bridge, but it can also be a brick wall. And that if we, if we begin to buy, and you alluded to this, this, Ingrid, uh, that, that 
everything is under a function of a certain determinism. And the whole question raised of, well, if you've had lousy nurture, mm -hmm. or if you have a lousy nature, uh, you may not be capable of, of compassion, that, that circumstances might, might prevent you from doing it. And I think what the spiritual traditions have to say is that, that pa compassion emerges in the domain that represents a freedom mm -hmm. which is unconditioned. And that human beings at every point in their life, no matter what kind of genes they have or history they have, have equal access to the unconditioned realm. And since that's beyond measurement, sure. it sort of has to be taken on faith, sure. Sure. but not that old blind faith sure. of the past because sure. the priest told you so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but on mm -hmm. some deeper capacity of the heart to, to validate through its own empiricism. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. So it would be very nice maybe in our next discussion after we hear our last speaker to come back to this question of how can we cultivate it when it's not present? We know it's natural. We know it's a a natural stand, it's home, but sometimes we're not in that space, and how can we come back to that? 